In this second module, we'll dive into understanding thunderstorms, particularly the recognition of important features commonly associated with strong and severe storms. Later on, we'll also briefly discuss different classifications of thunderstorms. And in the end, you'll be able to differentiate between significant thunderstorms that pose a high threat to life and property from ordinary weak thunderstorms. The thunderstorm life cycle consists of three stages. The first is the towering cumulus stage, followed by the mature stage, and then the dissipating stage. In the towering cumulus stage, all that is present is rising air known as an updraft. Visually, the cloud will be taller than it is wide as the updraft continues rising higher in the atmosphere. Now, since only an updraft is present, there is no precipitation or severe weather occurring at this point. In the mature stage, an updraft and a downdraft are now present, and because of this, precipitation is now allowed to reach the ground. And this is also the stage of the thunderstorm's life cycle when severe weather is most likely. In the final stages of a thunderstorm's life cycle, the updraft is overcome by sinking air and essentially becomes choked off. Shortly after the updraft dissipates, there's still a layer of rain aloft that will end up falling to the ground within the downdraft. So even though the storm may appear to be done with, strong or severe winds, heavy rain, and lightning are still possible during this stage. But by and large, these will be short-lived as the storm has already lost its updraft. In this time-lapse video, the first two stages of the thunderstorm life cycle can clearly be seen by the rising currents of air shown by the towering cumulus clouds. With time, one of these towering cumulus clouds reaches tens of thousands of feet into the sky and eventually flattens out as it reaches a stable layer of fast-moving air high in the atmosphere. At this point, the mature stage of the thunderstorm is underway as both an updraft and downdraft are in progress. So now that we understand the life cycle of a thunderstorm, let's look at some of the most common features associated with storms. In the previous time-lapse video, we noticed a flat formation at the top of one of the storms. In this photo shown here, you can clearly see the same structure, which is known as an anvil. Now, nearly all thunderstorms have anvils, and these result when the updraft reaches a stable layer of air that prevents it from rising any higher. Below the anvil, you can notice these cauliflower-like clouds stacked up, which denote the main updraft of the storm. Also present in this example is a downdraft, although it's a bit hard to see in this photo, but it is located to the left of the updraft here. And from afar, you can usually notice downdrafts by streaks of rain or hail falling to the ground. And depending on how well the thunderstorm is organized, sometimes you may see a stair-stepping of towering cumulus clouds that are attached to the main updraft. Now, this escalator of clouds is known as a flanking line and usually accompanies well-organized thunderstorms. So if you were outside looking at a thunderstorm in the distance, how might you know which way the storm is moving? Well, provided you can see the anvil, most storms will move toward the direction of the tip of the anvil. This is because stronger winds aloft in the atmosphere blow the anvil downwind, while the upwind side of the anvil is oftentimes squared off. In this photo, we are looking north at a storm, and based on the pointy long end of the anvil, we know the storm is likely moving from left to right, or easterly in this case. Now, the only drawback to this rule of inferring storm motion from the anvil is that rotating storms, otherwise known as supercells, will oftentimes have motions that deviate from the winds aloft. Now, before we move into recognizing clues of severe thunderstorms, we need to first know exactly what a severe thunderstorm is. Well, a severe thunderstorm is classified as having any or all of the following. Hail of at least one inch in diameter or larger, winds of 58 miles per hour or greater, or a tornado. Okay, now that we know what a severe thunderstorm is, let's look at some telltale signs of severe thunderstorms. From afar, a severe thunderstorm will often feature an overshooting top located above the anvil. Now this overshooting top results from an intense updraft that penetrates the stable layer of air at the anvil height. Many times these overshooting tops will be cyclical in nature 
as they form, collapse, and then redevelop over the course of several tens of minutes. Now keep in mind that you'll only be able to see an overshooting top if the storm is sufficiently far away from you. Now another clue that a storm might be severe is a back sheared anvil. In this example, the anvil is being blown from left to right by strong winds aloft. But since the updraft of the storm is intense enough, it can actually spread the anvil backwards into the wind. Now this indicates a very intense updraft and a high probability of a strong or severe thunderstorm. Now a third clue that the storm we're looking at here is probably severe is shown by the main updraft of the storm, which appears as very thick and mounded clouds with crisp or sharp cloud outlines. Now if instead the updraft of this storm appeared as fuzzy or soft, then we could say quite confidently that the storm would likely not be severe. Here's a different example of a severe thunderstorm. But similar to the last example, we notice very thick and sharp cloud outlines, this time more so in the anvil region of the thunderstorm. Again, if the anvil or main updraft of the storm appeared as soft or fuzzy, the storm's intensity would be much lower than we see here. In slide 10, we learned about a backsheared anvil. Well, in this case, take note of the appearance of the underside of this particular backsheared anvil. The updraft of this storm is so intense that not only is it able to push the anvil backwards into strong winds aloft, but it's also creating what's known as knuckles on the underside of the backsheared anvil. Now, if you ever see knuckles this well defined, you can be certain the thunderstorm is producing some type of severe weather. Anyway, in all the previous examples, we were located pretty far away from the thunderstorms, but now let's move in closer and focus on severe weather clues that are occurring below the base of the storm. In this particular photo, the observer is located alongside a thunderstorm, looking at what's known as a downburst. Now, downbursts are intense downdrafts that produce damaging winds as they strike the ground and have nowhere to go but outwards. They may contain rain or hail, or sometimes be completely void of precipitation altogether. Now, since downbursts are much more common than tornadoes, it's important to understand that they can produce damage equivalent to that of a weak tornado. And to drive that point home, here's the aftermath of a downburst that struck the Esteline and Childress areas back in the summer of 2009. The peak wind gust at the Childress airport was actually clocked at 102 miles per hour during this downburst. And some residents believe this was a tornado given the extent of damage, but as was later shown during a storm survey the following day, the damage associated with this event featured debris being blown outwards over a wide path, which is a hallmark of downbursts. On the other hand, damage from tornadoes tends to have debris concentrated inward near the path of the tornado. So how do you recognize a downburst? Well, the easiest method involves looking for what's known as a rain foot, or a dust foot in those cases where little if any rain is falling. In this photo, the dark gray mass is torrential rain falling rapidly to the ground, and as it hits the ground, it spreads out and upward, indicating very strong winds in progress. And in those cases where very little rain is falling, you'll see nothing but just some blowing dust, which is a dust foot as shown here in the inset photo. Now, if downbursts grow large enough over dusty areas, then they can become large walls of dust along the edge of the downdraft or thunderstorm gust front. Now, meteorologists call these walls of dirt haboobs, and here in the National Weather Service Lubbock forecast area, many times each year we see haboobs of various sizes and intensities, and visibility can fall to near zero with wind speeds easily over 60 miles per hour, so these are some very dangerous storms that residents and certainly storm spotters need to be aware of. So what are some clues to look for that would tell you if a storm's producing hail? Well, one feature is called a hail shaft, and as we see here in the photo in the upper left, if you're behind a thunderstorm, most times hail shafts will take on a milky white appearance. But if you're in front of a storm, say the storm's approaching your location, well, the hail shafts usually aren't quite as vivid as that. In fact, the only clue in that case will oftentimes be a green or aquamarine color in the sky. And in the case of very large hailstorms, sometimes observers have reported hearing loud, audible roars up to a mile or so in advance of the storm. Based on what we've learned so far, 
What would you say we're looking at in this photo? Is this a strong or weak thunderstorm? Look closely at this photograph and decide for yourself if you see anything that would lead you to believe this is a severe thunderstorm. In this final section of the training module, we'll talk briefly about the thunderstorm classification scheme. And generally speaking, all thunderstorms can be classified into one of four different categories, ranging from a pulse thunderstorm, which poses the least threat to life and property, all the way up to a supercell thunderstorm, which has the greatest threat for causing destructive weather. Here in the Texas South Plains, pulse storms tend to be most common during the summer months, when winds in the atmosphere are very light. And because of this, when there's instability combined with heating during the afternoon hours, these updrafts form, and they tend to be very upright and after a short period of time these updrafts will become choked off by precipitation so that's why pulse storms generally only last for about 15 to 30 minutes at most producing very minimal severe weather but a downburst and small hail can occur from some pulse storms but as a whole most pulse storms generally don't produce much severe weather at all and more importantly these storms are very small in aerial coverage perhaps only one to three miles wide at most so thunderstorms that have more than one updraft and downdraft we call multi-cell cluster storms. Now these storms are more organized than pulse storms and can last from 30 minutes to a couple hours and cover an area several miles wide. Now these storms, since they're more organized, can produce damaging winds, large hail up to about golf ball size, flash flooding, and even some brief tornadoes. So similar to multi-cell cluster storms, a multi-cell line is literally just multi-cell thunderstorms arranged in a line and these can extend from a couple miles wide up to several hundred miles in size and last for several hours. Commonly squall lines are found along fast moving cold fronts and even some dry lines and squall lines they are quite notorious at producing damaging winds oftentimes right along the leading edge of the thunderstorm gust front and that's why if you see a squall line it's important to remember the key phrase the worst is first and that means the worst wind hail and even heavy rains will be right at the leading edge of the storm and last but certainly not least are supercell thunderstorms and unlike the other storm classifications we've seen what makes these different is that their updraft has persistent rotation and because of that rotation, these storms are rather notorious for producing tornadoes. In fact, all violent and long-lived tornadoes that have occurred have been from supercells. Now, unlike squall lines that can extend up to several hundred miles in size, supercells compact their energy into a rather small area, usually a couple miles in width. But because they're pulling in so much energy over a small area, they're very, very significant for producing destructive weather. And certainly here on the Texas South Plains, these are not uncommon. And we'll learn more about supercell storms in much greater detail in the following module.